Hello everyone, it's me Joe, and I'm back with another reaction. And we're back with the pig. Uh, <laughs> uh, why am I doing this? Alright, to entertain you lovely people. <laughs> Yes, we're back with Laser Pig, and Laser Pig recently dropped the new video, and I am immediately worried. I was I was told about this during one of my streams last couple days. God damn it, Nate! <laughs> but yeah, so I told I was said this video came out: the myth of Vitman. Oh boy, he's going straight for the wearaboo jugular. Oh boy, man, that happened. One moment. Oh, why? Why does ever, ever, I have literally been called in Discord, called by family, called by everybody. I am popular this week for some reason. I don't know. Anyway, yes, you just saw my mother. Hello. Anyway. Uh, anyway, yeah. We're, girlfriend, this guy, doubt it. Never gonna happen. I know what I am. Anyway. Why you have Well, fortunately, I've been actually been given a note from my doctor saying, and this is a joke. This is one hundred percent a joke. But but in all honesty, all my people are saying, don't punish your liver like this. So yes, I'm doing this sober. I hate myself. <laughs> I've stopped hating my liver, and now I'm gonna hate myself. Oh boy! But yeah, we're going right for the wearaboo juggler, Michael Vitman. The Werabus, oh, the ultimate famous notice me senpai of the Werabus. I hate myself. Anyway, before we watch this video, make sure you like and subscribe, turn on notifications, follow me on all my social media down below in the description. I think it's down there. And if you really want to support this channel, get your name at the end of my videos. And also just keep giving all my adorable puppy dogs, including that cute little one hiding behind in the closet. Luna, say hi! There she is. <laughs> if you want to keep giving them cookies and giving them lots of treats, down below there's a join button for my YouTube memberships. Feel free to sign up. It always loves supporting the channel. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going in sober. This might break me worse than the Armata video because, yeah, I know Whitman. I've had to live... Oh, oh you know what? Let's just get started with the pig. Let's get him up, and I am already worried. Here, uh, pig up. I'm worried. Let's get this video started in three, two, one, and... So when I was younger and I was taking my first baby steps into the world of history, I always imagined myself visiting museums and old dusty archives, rustling through piles yeah, of ancient documents and squelching through fields with a metal detector. I was perhaps even young and naive enough to imagine that maybe one day I'll get a job working for an archive, or perhaps I'll oversee a collection in a museum, or maybe I'll dive headfirst so far down the history knowledge hole I shall ascend to that greatest of all historian positions, being a guest star on Channel 4's Time team. <laughs> nice. I dreamed of the days I would host my Whitman, my dear friend Nate, was quote-unquote Germany's premier tanker panzer ace. So yeah, when in fact, yeah. You know what? Let's not jump ahead of us. Who knows? Maybe the pig has done just as much research on the son of on the son of a bitch as I have. 
my own historical documentaries, write my own books, and, and give lectures in universities. I never would have imagined that I would spend most of my life from that point on, sitting with my face buried in my hands while yet another tea-drinking beardy man in a cardigan tells me the fascinating story of how the Russians strapped landmines to dogs and how ironic it was oh. that the dogs immediately turned around and blew up the Russian tanks. Oh, how I laughed the first 40-odd times. It didn't do too I well for my character, pig. I must admit. I became somewhat loathing of my friends every time they would mention to someone that I was into history, and I would look over with that mixture of fear, loathing, and pure hatred. And sure enough, there was that casual nod, and then that slow smile spread across that stupid face as they began their assault on my mental health. This was me in my college history class. I shit you not. There were so many people. I, I, we were on the third fucking floor, and I wanted to chuck these people through the fucking window. Needless to say, I was the only one really in there wanting to get a history degree. Little did I know it was as worthless as the toilet paper it was written on. Well, did you know? And... Once again, well, I had to listen. Well, did you know? Yes, I did. It's like it's like I almost study this thing religiously. It's almost as hist like history is my Bible at this point. <sighs> and there goes my heart rate. It's spiking again. Why did I do this so much? As they continue to drone on about their batshit theory that if the Germans had won, we'd have none of this woke shit. We'd have colonized Mars and have laser guns by now. You politely restrain yourself as they comment how the Allies had won just by sheer weight of numbers. And if only the Germans had built more Panther tanks, then you and I would be speaking German by now. Of course, I've always proclaimed one yeah. can never truly call yourself a historian that unless you develop line, a serious yeah. eye twitch anytime one of these fuckers opens their mouth. And you become almost filled with this blind rage and the voices of a thousand of your ancestors chanting unison, egging you on to jam a history book down the fucker's mouth, screaming your fiercest battle cry so that maybe, just maybe, he might actually learn something. Some say- Pig, you and I need to drink together. We would share such horror stories about these fucking neckbearded- <laughs> That is excessive in terms of force. I say you haven't lived until you've taken down at least one of these idiots at a wine tasting party with a hardback copy of Defeating the Panzer Stuka Menace by David Lister. Hmm. Other books are available. I did, at one point, start writing my own history book. Unfortunately, no publisher would ever take me seriously when I insisted that the entire thing be printed on fuzzy felt to appeal to the general audience. I'm ranting again, and I don't apologize for it. There are boos. You've seen them. They're Oi! always sticking around in web forums and discussion blogs, historical discussion tabs and discords, or the side chat of World War II games. Whenever uh, history is being discussed, a weraboo will be found, scuttling yeah. around under rocks and into the dark places. Amateur historians who have seen a few documentaries, read yeah. a few books. Average weraboo and Discord mod right here, ladies and gentlemen. Not counting my mods. I actually chose my mods and I went for them specifically because they're not this guy. These guys, this, when I said, okay, you want to be in my Discord bot? Okay, don't be this guy. This guy. This guy. Just this guy. And think they've come to some pretty exciting conclusions. Actually, you know what? No, no, sir, I disagree. That is not a wearable. I don't care what you've been told. A man who thinks Nazi Germany was the greatest military force in the world is not a wearable. That's just a common idiot. The sheer magnitude of books and films and That's documentaries true. released over the past 60 years, which have proclaimed this invincible Nazi empire as a fact, has been overwhelming. The idea of the revolutionary, incredible, and oh so invincible Nazi war machine. Stopped only by sh if they were if they were so invincible, the numbers shouldn't have mattered to them, and they would have won regardless. These guys, let's these guys could never have ever 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 have won World War II. Why? Well, simple. They were run by shit leaders. They had a shitty ideology. They had shitty builders. They had shitty tactics. The only reason they got such a fucking head start in the 
fucking beginning of the war is because everybody else was thinking, oh, it's just going to be like World War One again. It's going to be like World War One, and uh, why aren't they building trenches? Why are they just going past? Oh shit, they've taken Paris. Oh my god, they've reached Normandy. Fuck, boys, run! Yes, once um. Once, once the British and the rest of the Allies got their shit kicked out of them a bit in this in the fields of France in 1940, they got their shit together and they actually figured, okay, so this is gonna be like World War One. What are we going to do? Well, let's start by actually, oh, I don't know, looking into new tactics, new tactics, logistical strength, and brand new spanking leaders with revolutionary new ideals, like Montgomery, like Patton, like De Gaulle. Like Zukov, my boy Zukov. <sighs> Germany could never have won World War II, no matter how cool the Panther or the Tiger or whatever looks like. We had the numbers, we had the better generals, and we had more people. The Ubermensch were defeated by all of our, by all of us like lower people. What does that say about them? Sheer numbers of inferior tanks is what I'd expect any common idiot on the street to tell me. Let's call him John. John! A variable is typically someone who has not fallen in love with history. They care not for any crumb that Oh, that is cr knowledge This is the definition of cringe! ...subject of German Second World War stuff. And they write endless pages of comments justifying their belief in the Nazi war machine and how it laid the foundations of modern warfare. Dare no. I say we even use Blitzkrieg as a battle tactic today, they might proclaim. Verabu might even tell you if you could stand the stench on their breath, but they're not a Nazi, no sir. They don't believe in the politics. They just think Nazi stuff was the best and looks the coolest. No. Essentially, they've fallen Then you have a aesthetic. problem! And the biggest part of that aesthetic is the idea of the refined officer class. Class, big offices, fabulously decorated homes, and an air of professionalism and pride discussing war tactics over a glass of wine or a really? fine whiskey dress. Oh, you're, you're using Inglorious Bastard? That's my favorite Tarantino flick! It's also my field manual if any of these fuckers decide to take over. <laughs> in the most immaculate of uniforms, conducting themselves Immaculate the uniform. Gentleman. The French had better now, uniforms. If I, I, want, we both if I wanted a copy of military uniform to maybe, like, inspire, like, like my own perfect fucking, um, my own fucking, my own fucking, like, egocentric uniform, I'd copy the French! The Kepe looked way fucking better. Moving on. This is all complete I'm bullshit. Th these were not refined gentlemen. These were drug adult psychopaths. It's giving me a tumor right here. I house. feel like we would fall into childish petty squabbles at the drop of a hat. The idea of the refined German officer was a myth created by Nazi propaganda and enhanced in the 50s to try and get the new member NATO states used to the idea of working with their former enemy Germany. Look at this refined, honorable gentleman who did his duty and fought fiercely. And if Germany have a few more of those, then the Russians don't stand a chance. And into this myth comes a wave of published memoirs documenting their side of the story, blaming Hitler for everything and proclaiming loudly that if they just had everything they needed and more importantly had everyone else, everyone else in this context being the dead ones, not spent their time squabbling over prestige tokens Fuck that Germany these would have monsters. Won. But you know, probably also because they were angling for jobs as advisors to NATO, who were probably very interested in speaking to anyone who had experience fighting. If there was, if there's, look, if there's anything I have to say about NATO, the only thing NATO has ever done wrong is high, is, is looking into, oh, well, let's get the Germans involved. No, they should not have gotten involved. No, nine, nicht, no, 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 no. God damn it, NATO stick with the winners. Team the Russians. Now, a crime prince of this has always been Mr. Heinz I Invented Everything Guderian, who wrote in his book, which has been revised numerous times by various people to include yet more great feats of military strategy, that he single handedly invented the idea of combined arms warfare. Though I must also give credit to Rommel, who got a head start by writing his book mid war and then having everyone else publish a fairy tale version of it translated into every language possible after his death, in which he talks about these dashing clashes of armor jewels in the opening months of. 
France and Africa, forgetting that he was so petty when he received an order he didn't agree with or from someone he didn't like, he would switch off his radio set and ignore it, only turning it back on when he'd outrun his own supply lines and needed to beg for fuel, yeah. which he did consistently. Far from being the military genius, he was a one-trick pony that relied on British incompetence in the desert, which yeah. he routinely failed to take advantage of, driving his entire forces into pointless charges to cover as much ground as possible until they ran out of fuel and became easy prey for dug-in Allied defences. Yeah. Once the Brits got their shit sorted out, Rommel lost every single battle. But of yep. course, his memoirs would just blame that on the silly Italians. He was not to blame. He was a military genius. Oh, yes. The thing that I keep on saying, people, as a man of Tuscan and Sicilian descent, I can fully trace my lineage there. Back to, back to the motherland. <sighs> Italians. Every hundred years, we fight one good war... And we do excellent at it, and then for the rest of that century, we cook. World War One, the Italians did great. World War Two, uh, what do you do? And you're stupid. We just fought a war. You're messing up the system. <sighs> she was, but our idiots. story does not concern these boys. Our story centers on another one, one who thankfully did not get to write his own memoirs, though he did write his own legacy. He is one of the most talked about tank commanders in history. No one could even mention German World War II tanks without bringing him up, and even the History Channel made this wonderfully funny documentary where they proclaimed that if he were alive today, he would still be one of the greatest who ever lived. His story has spawned countless legends, books, stories, inspired films, and a generation of man babies parading up and down their house and eff if I saw that I'd seriously forgo the f if I saw that in public I would punch that guy square in the face oh you wouldn't hit a guy wearing glasses oh, oh watch me I will <laughs> says uniforms uh. pretending they are him yes today we are talking about that bastard Michael oh look at that ugly face you just want to punch it he just wants to shove a 75 millimeter round Whitman? through his And why is he so face? famous? Whitman was a tank commander, yeah. often cited as a tank ace, the Black Baron or the ace among aces by post-war sensationalist news articles and books. He was the son of a farmer who rose quickly through the ranks, first as a guard in the Liebenstander, and then for the LSSAH as a driver and then commander of an armoured car during the Polish campaign. His daring, patience and charming attitude made him quite favoured among his commanders. Also, he was Bavarian, which kind of does help and he quickly found himself being retrained as the commander to a squad of Stug-3 assault guns. Whitman would serve with honours, operating first in Yugoslavia and then in Greece before finally being shipped out to the Eastern Front, where his actions with the Stug destroyed a number of he got sent to the Eastern Front. and earned him the Iron Cross second class. His reward for bravery was to command the Russian tankers who had survived their encounter with him be given the very best of medical care, thus earning him a reputation as a gentleman and a man of honour. His success would continue through 1942 and 1943. He would earn even more awards in this time. The Knight's Cross, the Iron Cross First Class, the Tank Assault Badge in Silver, and the Wound Badge in Black. Several promotions later, and he was finally selected for officer training. He probably then won several more awards, including the Royal Bulgarian Soldier's Cross of the Order of Bravery Second Class in August, and later in the same month he was decorated with the Eastern Front Medal. But it would be here that Whitman would be retrained. Uh, to give you advanced, basically you weren't considered pure German unless you were Bavarian. That was the whole thing, Steph Stefan. All, almost, all, almost all of the Nazi leadership was Bavarian. They were from Bavaria. So, and this is why I'm like, I take so much pride in being a Prussian. Having Prussian descent, because none of us would ever fucking do this uh, there's a story about my grandmother. I'll tell you. I probably, I probably have already said it, but if not, I'll tell you all at a later date. Yeah, Bavaria. Not as an assault gun commander, but as a tank commander. And the tank he would be given command of would be the mighty Panzer VI, the Tiger. 
He was also briefly in charge of a Panzer III, but so little of that time has been recorded. And oh, come on, the Panzer III is a good he tank. He take part in the famed Battle of Kursk and end his career on the Eastern Front, having yeah, scored the a new... Yeah, the famed Battle of Kursk that the Germans lost. Lost! Near total of 90 kills, never having lost a tank under his command. He would be awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross and later the Oak Leaves to the Iron Cross upon receiving a personal telegram yeah, from Hitler screw himself. You. Now, if you haven't already guessed by the. Like I said, Marcus, there's one thing I've always been known. There's one thing I've always known about the Nazis. They were absolutely batshit insane. So, yeah, don't look for consistency, don't look for any accuracy. These people were the masters of evil fucking bullshit. Just evil goddamn bullshit. I mean, it is just ugh. Don't look for don't look for consistency when you're talking about these fucks. For the title of this video, a lot of what I've just told you might sound a little bit suspicious. In fact, it feels like I'm almost reading from fan fiction, which is good. It means your skeptical senses are working today. My skeptical senses are always working when it comes to World War II shit, big. If it's somehow glorifying these fucks, I'm immediately suspicious. I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, sure. And boy, are you going to need them. Because now we get to the most famous battle of Whitman's career. The Battle of Villers-Bucage. It's June 1944. D-Day has begun. And the combined arms of the- My grandfather's hiding under a bush somewhere. <laughs> along with the rest of his 101st Airborne Platoon, most likely. Just outside Can Con or Caratan at this point. United States, Canada, and Britain. As well as the not to be oh, understated American France, Poland, and India. Oh goddamn, the Canadians, that's right. The Canadians already committing multiple war crimes on their way Normandy, through France. The mighty German Reich, having spent the first half of the war laughing at France and its line of static defenses, while proclaiming loudly that in this new age of mobile armored warfare, static defenses are useless, and decided the best defense against these landings was a series of static defenses. Hmm. This goes about as well as expected. Though far from a cakewalk, the landings are successful. Allied forces establish a beachhead, and around 130,000 troops now push inland. In the British sector, the city of Caen, which was originally penned as a day one objective, is proving a somewhat difficult nut to crack. Caen has vital airfields as well as rail and road links. Taking it is a priority, as if the Germans can hold it, they can more easily reinforce the units which are currently fighting in the American sector. Now, the yes. Brits and Canadians have a tough time with this because, as every British historian with an axe to grind <coughs> after suffering from years of it being forgotten that Britain even did anything during World War II will happily <laughs> point out, the vast majority of Germans' elite troops and panzer divisions were pointed at them. Not That's that the true. Americans were having a particularly easy time regardless. They had Patton leading them, which, you know, at this point should have really just been considered an act of sabotage. Now, uh, in order to try... I know Patton was an ass, but come on, Dick, cut him with just a wee bit of slack, just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. He was a decent commander, he was okay. Was he perfect? Was he a, was he a, was he this great noble commander that the legends built? No, he's not, but he was a decent commander, he did an okay job. Yeah, mostly all they threw, they threw at my, at my grandfather with fucking falls from Jaeger and standard German army. So, but yeah, there was still a lot of them. Trying to surround the besieged city of Caen, the Brits attempt a flanking maneuver, which oh will take boy. them through the town of Villers Bucage. And it's here they come face to face with the one and only Michael Whitman. And what the fuck happens? Once upon a time, there lived a little <laughs> tank company, and as the sun beat down upon this company, it glazed the silken dark Bavarian skin of the true man, one Michael Whitman. Oh, he flexed I... his perfectly toned muscles and laughed his beautiful laugh. Ha 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 ha! His hair flowing majestically in the wind! Gosh, you're so cool, said the other tankers, and pinned yet another medal to his bare chest. But he just laughed off the pain because he was cool like that. But alas, the evil British Empire and their backwards monarchy society had come to ruin the day. We're uh, going to bomb the old folks' home in Dresden, they said with their twisted evil smiles. But Whitman would not allow such a thing, so he leapt from his chair and single-handedly destroyed 20 tanks before flying back across I'm the border I'm, to uh, safety. I am, I am thinking. And the angels did cheer. Monty, but that's, that's, that's what the wearables think happened. 
I knew it was fanfic. I knew it. Where Michael Whitman is the commander of a tiger tank, and during one of the many battles in France that took place I'm after D Day, he allegedly fought the vanguard of the I British do know about the Armored Brigade, the Fucking famed boss. Desert Rats single-handed, destroying over 20 tanks completely by himself in a village called Village Vitaz. You're damn right I regret now, being I sober guess, during this. Of this video, that's not actually what happened. What actually happened is going to be a little bit confusing, at least at first. Now you see, we do have a lot of sources about this battle. The British would publish two reports in it, the Germans three. Whitman was even interviewed for radio, and some of the British tankers involved were interviewed by the British newspapers, who compiled it all together into a story. The problem is is all of these sources greatly disagree with each other over what happened. Now, if you're a typical historian who's used to working with primary sources, that will not be of any great shock to you. This happens a lot in history. It's why I laugh at people when they tell me that being a historian is all about shuffling through dusty old archives and looking at primary sources. It's not. That's about a third of it. But a huge problem with a lot, not all, but a lot of historians, is they tend to get born into academia. They get used to the library and the classroom and think that's all there is, or think that's the single most important part. It's not. There's actually this thing called the historian's triangle of academia, practical, and reenactment. Once you've done all three, then you've probably got a better understanding of what went down. But as you might expect, a lot of people in academia don't really value reenactors so much. And a lot of reenactors get really pissed off at snotty academics telling them that they're wrong. Yeah. That's why I've always said if you want to be a historian, don't study history, study people. Yes! History will absolutely. Teach you dates and events, and if you're on a route- If you want to study history, if you want to study the history of the world, study people. People is the best way to understand history. If you understand the people, you understand the, t the the history. If you understand the people, you understand the place. If you understand the people, you understand the time. That is what really makes it. But this is one of the hardest things to do because one thing I've noticed when it comes to people, this is something I learned in college by watching people, learning from them. People don't like it when the other people look evil. People l don't like it when perfectly normal, average, everyday people turn out to be monsters. Looking through history, you'll start reading about like, oh, this guy was such a great guy. He did such good. Oh shit, he killed a, he killed a million people. Holy fuck, what the hell? This is the biggest problem with historians. This is the biggest problem with history in general. We get this idea that humans are that there's this black and white with people that there's either you're either born a hero or you're born a villain when in fact that's never the case evil is not born evil is formed it is molded it is created it happens it happens slowly to create a, a monster isn't born a monster is made this is literally the biggest issue with historians is they is when they figure out about a person there are, now there are some people that are completely 100 percent evil but it's usually but most of the time there but there are few exceptions there are few there are few people that are truly born as monsters there's very few very few i mean literally i can probably count the number of like truly evil like born evil people i can probably count them on my hands on both hands i still have fingers left over but the biggest issue is is when studying people is you learn that some of the people that became monsters didn't start out as monsters. Yeah, biggest example. For all you nerds out there, look at fucking Darth Vader. He is the best example of that. But yeah, but there and then there but and and most of the time like you'll turn out like I think we're going to turn out with Whitman here. I don't all, all he's going to turn out to be is just a fucking asshole. Just a fucking cruel asshole. That's probably all we're going to turn out with here. Anyway, continuing on. Really good course, how to look up things in an archive and label your sources correctly. Studying people will give you a better perspective on how the human mind works and how people think. And that's important because academia... It also hurts my head and gives me trust that a primary issues. primary source overwrites everything else. 
and doesn't handle particularly well the idea that it was a human who wrote that primary source. Mm -hmm. Humans who notoriously get things wrong, who lie, who exaggerate, or think they saw something when they didn't, or remember something very clearly that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. If you try telling a professor that the sources he cites might be wrong because they were written by humans and watch him swell up like a balloon. In our case, every single report on the Battle of Villas Bukage is wrong. Whitman's original report was edited by Nazi propagandists to put Whitman center stage and make him sound a lot more heroic. The radio interview was by Signal, a Nazi propaganda magazine whose sole purpose was to make everything Nazi Germany sound amazing and brilliant. It's available online and is often used by a source by idiots who have yet to realise that Nazi Germany lied. Quite a lot. A lot! Obvious, Whitman's second Damn lied lot. because he wanted to make himself sound more heroic, and he was tired of constantly playing second fiddle to Whitman. The Panzer Lair lied because they weren't there. They arrived much later, and Kurt Mayer, who was its commander at the time, famously hated Whitman. But he would go on to survive the war, and become one of the most prolific Nazi apologists of the 1950s, who would write books and give grand- Man, it's almost like this paramilitary political force here had a, um, had an ego problem. Now, where have I heard that before? Hmm. and speeches in which he debunked what he claimed were the myths of Nazi war crimes and greatly over-exaggerated the might and power of the SS as a fighting unit. He now resides in his grave with a tombstone curly inspired by a Flash Gordon. The British on the- Is there a place I could go and piss on it? <laughs> On the other hand, well, the British are notoriously bad at writing reports. They hate doing it, and they typically want to get it over and done with as quickly as possible. Fair. None of the commanders who wrote reports actually witnessed the event, and British newspapers are not exactly known for their reliability and hard-hitting journalism, especially during the 1940s. Mm. Especially when you realise the newspaper who wrote the report was the Daily Mail. Oh, the other problem, I've of heard course, is if stories. you go into this, you will be balls deep in about 500 other historians, all milling around doing essentially nothing. Thing, all trying to be new and exciting without actually doing anything helpful. I'll give you an example. Please. The YouTube channel World War II TV, now this is a fairly decent channel, I do like it, did a video with Daniel Taylor back in 2020. Now, Taylor is the curator of the Kent and Sharpshooters Museum. The Sharpshooters in the Queen's Own were the groups present at Villas Bukage. So out of everyone, I believe this man has the most knowledge on the subject matter, and it mm -hmm. would have been brilliant to actually hear what he had to say on it. The video by World War II TV, however, is a bit of a fever dream. They're doing it on the anniversary of the battle. Battle, and rather than just produce a video, they instead opt for a live stream, where in the middle oh. of COVID, they have a bunch of people roaming around Villas Bukage with cameras. They seem to believe that this would be some sort of epic, never done before spectacle, but in reality, they spend much of their time talking into dead air while they wait for a cameraman to get into position. They interrupt Taylor several times mid story because one of their cameramen is now finally standing on the road where all this happened. And then you get this grainy image of a road in France because their bandwidth is terrible and they're trying to do it over Zoom. They are plagued with technical issues. They even have the slideshow of images that isn't well prepared, and Taylor half the time just ends up holding a picture up to the camera. It's... Oh. There's a reason this channel only has 46,000 subscribers. There is a wealth of good information here, but it is presented so jarringly, it is a difficult video to watch. Ooh. It would have been far better had they just let Taylor speak and had little tokens moving around a map with references to the photos and where they were taken, and maybe some overviews on Google Maps to give a clearer picture of where everything was, rather than watching a guy get stuck in traffic for 20 minutes while he drives to the road, the actual road where the battle took place. Now, the actual road is no longer there, but as you can see where the hedgerows would have been if they were still there, it, it, it just... It's a mess. Work. Sounds like a Taylor fucking mess. Taylor is a very knowledgeable person. It would have been far better had everyone else just shut up and let him speak for an hour. But they had to advertise this as a fresh, new, exciting, never done before experience. And this is the main problem with the Battle of Villers Bukage. So what happened? This is quite potentially the most overstudied battle in history. And the problem is not a lack of information, but the sheer overwhelming amount of it. And most of it, which is contradictory or biased in nature, takes too much from one source, or takes Nazi propaganda as verbatim, or just repeats the same bullshit over 
and over and over. Now the absolute worst I could do here is wade asshole first into the shit storm, make up yet more shit, and then proclaim that my shit is better because it has come out of my ass. So I'm not going to. Instead, I'm just going to assume that Taylor's version of the timeline is correct and go through it dispelling any myths along the way. Now, okay. I know many of you will have heard a different version of this battle that you absolutely 100% know is the right version and may think I have gotten everything wrong and how dare I? I'm going to write a comment that'll show the pig. But frankly, Taylor has done more research than I have on this subject and more importantly, done more research than you have. So if you think I'm wrong, I'll be sure to pass your comments along. <laughs> Firstly, I think it's important to understand why the British were at Villers Bocage, and why they seem so complacent. They're sitting down to tea, they're not really prepared to fight anything, they're just doing maintenance. And the reason why they're doing this is kind of glossed over. It's typically put down as British stupidity that they would be halfway through a major assault and then stop to have tea. Which did happen. I'll be the first to admit that. The common British soldier was heavily unionised, so they demanded regular tea breaks. There's this famous story in Italy where a bunch of American paratroopers get lost in the dark and find a squad of Brits probing the front lines. So they link up with them and the Brits pause to have a tea break, much to the disbelief of the Americans. But this wasn't that. What was actually happening was panic on the German side. A series of very aggressive and very successful assaults across the American line had opened up a hole in the German defences directly between the British and American sectors. Sensing they had very little time to act, the Brits then pushed into this gap. Their objective is a big hill called Point 213. If the Brits can control this, they can easily see the movements of anyone surrounding Khan and, more importantly, direct artillery onto anyone surrounding Khan. Now, to get to that point, the Brits will have to push through this village, Villas Bucarge. Now when they get there, French civilians are celebrating. There had been a German command post and a field hospital there, but those had been abandoned. The few German soldiers left surrendered without a fight. The French were adamant the Germans had fully retreated from the area and that German tanks were in a different town several miles away. Now, it would be wrong to think that the Brits had not been doing their own recon. A lot of British commanders at the time were worried that not enough reconnaissance was being done, so this kind of gets picked up on quite a lot. But they actually were. The problem was twofold. Firstly, it was the speed of the advance. It had to be fast. The Brits yeah. were hoping their advance would go undetected, but sporadic sniper fire, a Panzerschreck ambush which lost them a Sherman, and a few encounters with armoured cars proved that the Germans indeed knew exactly where they were and could probably guess where they were going. So they had to, in the words of one famous blue hedgehog, go fast. <laughs> the second problem was that they were in fact doing their own recon. They had flooded the surrounding countryside with armoured cars. But we're talking this is 1940s French countryside. A lot of people I don't think truly understand the power of a French hedge. Yeah! This is a British hedge. It's basic, it's leafy, it keeps your neighbours out of your yard, and you use it to stash poor Max and beer because your mum won't let you have those in the house. This is a French bouquage. Show me hedge. the horror. Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, the French head ro hedge rows were fucking nightmares because they were solid earth and mount and stone. I mean, it was fucking madness. There is a reason. Like, if you look at pictures of the nor of our of the days after D the D Day landings, you'll see Shermans with bulldoze bulldozer blades on the front of them, and they were meant to put. That was what they were expecting to punch through those hedges with. Hell. My, my fucking, my fucking grandfather, he once told me that one time when he was, when he was here, that literally you could march an entire platoon through those hedges in between that, that were deep behind German lines and no one would fucking know they were there. They could literally march in full formation through in between those hedgerows in those little spots between the hedges and not a single german could would see or hear them because it would just they would just walk on there they said they could they never tried i, I never found out they tried but that was the joke he told me i don't oh my 
God. Those fucking hedges. Hang anything through those, especially if it's got wheels, is almost impossible. So the armored cars have to follow the roads, and all roads lead to Khan. Specifically, yeah. lead to where the Germans are trying to push into the city. There are yeah. very few roads leading south, so the Brits basically have to go in blind, following the one route they can. Yeah. Now, when Whippen begins his attack charging down this road, you'd be forgiven for thinking that he was attacking the main British advance, which had stopped for tea, because that's usually how the story starts. The dumb British sitting down for tea. Ha 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 ha. It was not the main British advance. The main advance, a group of Shermans from the sharpshooters, had already advanced towards the hill and secured it. Whitman had remained hidden as he watched them go by. Contrary to what many claim, he was not up a hill observing the British, he was in a dry riverbed, completely unaware that anything was going on, until certain officers and medical staff that were fleeing Brothers Bocage made him aware. Now, of course, Whitman wasn't alone. He had several other Tigers under his command, and there is this big debate debate about which tank he was actually in. I'm going to gloss over this because I want to get back to it later. Whitman begins his attack. He opens fire on the Sherman at the back of the column, which had the unfortunate name of Pistol Pack and Mama. That's not a Fallout reference, by the way, the tank was actually called that. <laughs> of course. Pistol Pack and Mama. Oh, of course. Whitman then bursts through this hedge and starts machine gunning down the convoy. The tank at the head of the column, a firefly, finds this somewhat disagreeable, and manages to rotate its turret and get a shot off at Whitman. I'll return to that bit later. Thankfully for Whitman, Sober is still- That's a fire- wait. So wait, Whitman? Wow. That was lucky. Because, I mean, the fucking- the fucking firefly. That tank was built- okay, so- Let's get another thing about the tiger. I think I might have talked about this when I first talked about the tiger with the pig a long time ago. But, um... We'd already known about the tiger, and we'd actually... The first time we ever... That any of the Allied forces ever encountered the tiger was in Africa. In fact, we had captured a good couple of them from Africa. In fact, one of the most famous ones is Tiger 131, which is at the Bovington Tank Museum, which I hope to go see one day. But at that point, we had, at this point already, we'd had time to study the tiger. Koa, chill out, buddy. I don't know what he's barking at. I let him out before we get started. But we'd already had time to study the tiger, and we came to find out, and the British, at least, came to find out that, wow, the 17-pounder right here was damn good at taking out tigers. Can we mount it inside a Sherman? And so that's what they did. So I'm immediately intrigued here that this firefly didn't immediately shred Whitman. Let's continue on. Full hanging around at a different tiger and manages to take it out. The oh. only other vehicles here are soft skin vehicles, yeah. largely half tracks. The American made M3, one of which is the medical half track, which Whitman fills full of holes. This is what one of. I'm sorry, um, did, 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 are we saying Whitman gunned down an ambulance? Sounds like a war crime to me! ...of those would have looked like. The hood is painted bright white with a red cross in it that Woodman would have been able to see from his elevated position. I'm making a point here, and I'll get back to it later. Whitman continues down this road, leaving Sober behind, where he encounters four Cromwell tanks. Now, I don't care how good his crew claimed they were. It took the best Tiger crews about six seconds to reload each shell. Four Cromwells firing back at him would have eviscerated Whitman. Mm -hmm. But this is where I present a new argument. Yeah, at this point, we had the shells. Even the, even the weak Shermans had armor-piercing shells that could maybe not have immediately shredded Whitman, I'm gonna go see what he wants. Be right back. What's up, Koa?
so fucking. I, I feel like this dog really doesn't appreciate my presence. Oh, this dog, this dog runs my life. This dog runs my life. You just wanted to go outside just to get my attention, didn't you? All right, lay down. Just lay down. Look pretty. I always got to obey the dog. Anyway, yeah, at this point, the fucking Shermans, like, going back on it, I mean, like, seriously, the... At this point, we had guns and shells that could, at the very least, match up with the tiger. Oh, no. Just go lay down, buddy. So, I don't know. Webin is not the greatest tank commander who ever lived. He is the luckiest one. Out of all the Cromwells on that road, only one was actually capable of firing at him. Two what? OP Cromwells having extra radio sets and built for artillery observation, one was unmanned. The only one capable of actually firing at Whitman did not have his gunner on board. So when he saw this tiger charging down the road towards him, he the took the most son of, a bitch! of action and reversed into a garden. Whitman would fail to spot him. This is Captain Pat Dias. He is going to become very important in just a little bit. Whitman's luck is going to continue as he enters the town. He comes across a Sherman. Lucky for him, it's an OP Sherman with a dummy gun, and the only crew member on board is the driver. Whitman misses the first shot, and the second goes through the turret and splits the dummy gun in half. The driver bails and claims he was shot at with MG fire. Whitman drives on or and comes number across two. a second tank. This is the Cromwell of Paddy Victory, a man who would survive this encounter and go on to write about it. By striking luck, Paddy had been attempting to back his Cromwell up and had gotten it wet edged onto a curbstone. It stretched out sideways across the street and can't move. He notices the tiger bearing down on him and decides to bail. Again, Whitman scores a kill without any return fire. Whitman carries on and comes across another tank, another firefly. Whitman takes aim at the firefly and misses. The Firefly does not. But in a startling moment of yet more good luck, Whitman orders the tank to reverse, and the Tiger lurches backwards at the exact same time the Firefly opens fire. The shot places a gash down the side of the Tiger's turret. This Lucky. will be important later. Whitman then re And as to me spoiling the doggo, why do you think I basically... S I'm not lying when I say, like, a port... Like, for all my members, which of currently there is one, and all the donations I get from you guys... A part of it, a definite part of it, a, a decent sized chunk goes to getting those dogs cookies. I'm not lying. I'm getting, I go out and I get these big boxes of milk bones. I think I have like a storage cabinet full of them at this point. Continuing on. Burst into a house, the rubble blocks the path of the firefly, throws dust and smoke into the air, and he's able to turn around and drive back the way he came. At this point, he comes across another Cromwell. This is the one commanded by Dias, the one okay. that reversed into the garden earlier. He's okay. chased Whitman into the town, and the two have now come face to face. And now finally, for the first time in this battle, an actual armored duel is about to take place place. And what transpires is pretty much what is written down. The Cromwell fires twice, cannot penetrate the tiger's armor, the tiger fires back, and Dias in his report describes the feeling of an 88mm shell passing between his legs. The crew bails. But there is something very wrong here. While every documentary and book that covers this duel will focus on Dias' frustration that his gun cannot penetrate the mighty armor of the tiger, in reality, it actually can. The Brits have been fighting tigers since 1943 over longer ranges with smaller guns. Of the 29 tigers that were sent to North Africa, none of them would return. The 75mm gun on the Cromwell is marginally more powerful than the one on the Sherman. At a range of roughly 100 meters, a shot from the Cromwell would split the tiger in half half. So why doesn't it? If you take away anything from a laser pig video when I start bitching about tanks, then it should be that penetration tables you find on the internet are not worth the pixels they take up on your screen. They're Rough really guys, Maybe, but as everyone should know by now, there are about a thousand factors which can affect penetration. The quality of the steel, the angle of attack, the temperature, even the weather. So class, can anyone tell me what factor has affected this poor Cromwell? No one? 
Well, children, creepy uncle Laserpig shall tell you. Originally, I thought it might have been the range, and I, I had this whole rant planned out at this point where I thought if the tanks were maybe too close, there was a chance, just a chance, that the tiger might have been inside the Cromwell's minimum range, and that the round was still too hot when it smacked against the tiger's armour, which might have just been enough to blunt the penetrating tip, causing it to deflect rather than pen. But given where Dias's Cromwell was found, and where Whitman's tiger was positioned when it was finally... Holy shit, 15, I don't know, I'm not sure of that currency, but thank you! Holy shit! I'm not sure of, I, I don't know what what currency that is, but 15 of something, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Super Shovel! Yes, yes, that will buy a nice big box of milk bones for the doggos. Believe me, I know the size of them quite well. <laughs> thank you very much! taken down, they are at least 300 meters apart, well outside the Cromwell's minimum range. And that last bit, that's actually quite significant. Where Dias's Cromwell was found doesn't make any sense. In an interview he gave in the 1980s, Dias claimed he stalked Whitman for about five minutes, hoping to get a chance at firing at the Tiger's rear. But the Cromwell is a fast tank. In fact, it's one of the fastest tanks in the Normandy theater. For Dias Yuan. to be in the position he was- That's the Yuan. I hate to pause the video in the meantime, but, um... You know hang on, I got my phone here. Oh! <laughs> well, what do you know? From China. <laughs> did not, uh... I did not expect that. That was the last... That, I have to admit, Super Shovel, I did not expect that. <laughs> Welcome anyway. Continuing on. He was in when he got taken out to give Whitman the time to engage a Sherman, a Cromwell, drive into the center of town, duel with the Firefly, turn around and start heading back out. Dias would have had to be driving at a pace slower than walking. Now here, you understand what that rant about primary sources was all about earlier on, because Dias is a primary source, and Dias is wrong. Oh. John Cloudsley Thompson, the famous naturalist, was one of the other Cromwell commanders that day. He and his crew were fortunate enough to escape, but in 1956, he would admit that he witnessed Dias speed out of the garden that he was in and chase after Whitman. Maybe he's watching this on some VPN stuff. Nice! almost immediately after he passed him. Assuming Whitman always fired on the move, Dias would have been able to catch up with Whitman as he drove past Paddy Victory. Paddy Victory had ordered his driver to hard reverse into a shop window while the crew jumped out. Whitman didn't notice this Cromwell until he was driving past it, at which oh. point, according to Captain Victory, he paused, turned the turret, and fired at the Cromwell, hitting it just below the turret. Paddy then jumped back into the Cromwell and attempted to fire the gun into the rear of the Tiger, but he couldn't move the turret. That's an... that's an... Oh, shekels. Where the... Okay, that was... I'm just like, what? Okay. Okay, now I'm curious. What the hell? Israeli! I... A fan from Israel! <laughs> Greetings! Man, I am... Ugh. Wait. That's in he... That's Hebrew letter. Come on, dude! You studied... I studied ancient Roman... I wrote a paper on the frickin'... I wrote a paper on the frickin' Siege of Asada. I should know Hebrew writing! Moron! I... I... Is... Moron! <laughs> I wrote a frickin' paper on the Siege of Masada for a college paper. Jesus, come on, dude. What the hell? So instead, he smashed up the on with this. best he could before eh, leaving, whatever. just in case it was captured. While he was doing Always this, nice to know he I have fans notice, all over Dias the world. drive straight past him, attempting to sneak up behind Whitman. But Whitman's turret was already pointed to his rear, and had the perfect shot on Dias as he rounded the corner. Mm. Dias didn't get a single shot off. Whether he is mistaken, misremembering, was encouraged by a documentary and sensationalist history book publisher to be a little bit, uh, economical with the truth, or rah forbid, straight up lying, I don't know. But his account has been retold by almost every single historian who has covered this event without question, including Taylor. Because in academia, questioning the account of a World War II veteran is akin to questioning the existence of God to a Christian.
Nothing, of course, detracts from Dias' bravery in the situation. Had Whitman noticed Paddy Victory's tank a little earlier, his turret would be facing the other way, and Dias would have ended him right there and then. But again, Whitman is not and the greatest And two pounds from Germany, he thank you. the luckiest. Or so yeah. Whitman carries on. He gets to the outskirts of the town, and when passing a grocery store, he or is hit in the side euros. with a six-pound Two, two euros gun. from Germany. Thank you. And he is forced to bail. He bails and bravely runs away. Bravely run away. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the convoy he supposedly destroyed en route into town. The troops had abandoned their vehicles. You're not wrong there, random. And, per tru and tru truth be told, like, I know I, ha I have a bit of a reputation with saying, like, tanks are kind of obsolete. The one group of tanks I actually like, I mean, and so, seriously, the one group of tanks I like, I think we should be, like, I think the West should be looking a lot more into is the Merkava line. Oh, shovel, you and you and the Israelis, you know how to build a tank for the 21st century. I'll give you that. Give me a Merkava any freaking day. Two German pounds. Okay. As Whitman tried to machine gun them eh. down, got themselves organized. A donation is a donation, and the weapons, puppies are happy. Into the village. Anyway, let's get back to this. Six pounder in the doorway was not a sudden stroke of luck for the Brits. It was a well-prepared ambush. Oh. Whitman then fires off a load of machine gun rounds, and the Brits decide to keep their heads down, allowing him to escape. So, so he ran away. This is, of course, the common Heroes. interpretation of events, and as you might expect, it's complete bullshit. The <laughs> Firefly I mentioned earlier was commanded by Sergeant Stan Lockwood. The common interpretation is that the Firefly was positioned here when Whitman spotted it. It was not. Lockwood was actually here, and according to him, Whitman was all the way over here, pretty much five or six yards from where he shot Victory and Dias. He was not, contrary to what you might have heard, taken out by a six-pounder gun hiding in a doorway. He never made it that far into the village. This image that is famously attributed to being Whitman's tiger is not. I'm not that knowledgeable. Lockwood's gunner sights had been configured incorrectly, and as a result, his shot hit the building next to Whitman, which created a lot of smoke and debris. Whitman turned around and bravely drove away. Bravely <laughs> he was later taken out here at Tilly Junction by the six-pounder gun that was positioned. Brave Sir Whitman ran right away, 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 away. <laughs> and on the road just up ahead. Now, this may be in contrast to what you probably have heard, because the getting taken out by a six-pounder gun hiding the doorway in the center of town is what Whitman claimed happened in his radio broadcast. His Nazi propaganda radio broadcast. But because the British commanders did not initially know what was going on, they took this broadcast as factual. And for Are you serious? Oh, oh, tell me, oh, tell me, Reginald, uh, what, did, what did we hear about this uh, battle? Oh, well, the Ger well, the German, the German radio says it was a six-pounder. Handed off by one of our Brits. Oh? Well, if the cherries say so, I guess it is so. In fact, they took it so matter-of-factly, they didn't even bother to check if it was true or not. Out of all the officers that would survive Villa's Bukage, including the one who would escape Point 213, none were ever debriefed. Their knowledge and experiences never made it into the reports, so the British ended up simply parroting Nazi propaganda. Now, part of the reason all this went unnoticed was because it allowed one General Dempsey to use the failure at Villa's Bukage to politically undermine his rival leading to the oh-so-famous almost public scandal about the inferiority of British tanks in the eyes of the public that every documentary will suddenly cut to at this point, which in turn led to the great problem of tiger panic among the troops. Go Britain. I think it needs to be a law that if you are in the frickin' military, you are not allowed to have any political aspirations. You should be banned from politics. Be a general, retire, and spend the rest of your days writing your memoirs. Don't go into politics! Oh!
But even now, decades later, this trend continues. While writing his book, Villa's Bocage Through the Lens, Taylor got the opportunity to speak with many of the veterans on the British side who were actually there, many of whom were so eager to speak on their experiences because no one had ever bothered to ask them about it. This should honestly give you an indication of the piss-poor level of research that many, in inverted commas, historians have actually done. If it had not been for Taylor, many of these men would have gone to their graves never having told their side of the story. Pat Dias, who was interviewed in the 80s and then parts of that interview were broadcast on the Discovery Channel documentary Killer Tanks in 2004, remains the only person on the Allied side who was ever interviewed on camera. Dias would maintain that Whitman had turned around by the time they came face to face, which cannot be true unless Dias sat around for several minutes doing nothing. Likely what happened was that, okay, so many Tiger tank commanders, in order to compensate for their turret's slow traverse and get the gun onto targets faster, would order the entire tank to turn with the turret. So when Whitman drove past Victory's Cromwell, he would have turned the entire tank, not just the turret, to get the gun on target faster. So when Dias came speeding around that corner, he would have seen Whitman's Tiger now facing him. That's actually true, and even in tank games, like like World of Tanks or even War Thunder, like it is quicker to, if you want to get on target quicker, it's Especially with the tiger, it's quicker to turn your tank than the, just the turret. Giving him the impression the tiger had turned around and was now coming back the opposite way. But even if he is mistaken about the order in which events took place, that can hardly be his fault. He was being asked to talk about something that from his perspective happened over 40 years ago. He was an old man, he'd lived an entire life since then, and most likely he had forgotten a lot of the details. That's but fair. what he did fair remember was that feeling of bitterness and inferiority and that the, spread among the Allied forces yeah. thanks and to the the feeling of an 88 propaganda millimeter machine, going right between his legs. The sense that German you don't forget something like that. Generations ahead of their own, which helped fuel the myths of the super advanced. German war machines that have only recently started to finally be questioned. For many, oh, Dice's shaky memory and Whitman's radio broadcast, as well as the small amount of photographs that have made their way online, are the only sources people consult when writing their works on Villers Bocage, which has allowed Whitman to achieve an undeserved legendary status and an incorrect timeline to circulate throughout the common press, a timeline which people continue to argue about to this day. There are now so many different versions of this timeline that it is now starting to rival Marvel. And even with all the work done by Taylor, which still goes largely ignored, people continue to argue about the Battle of villers bocage to this day. How many tanks did the British lose? How many tanks were actually there? Which tank was Whitman in? Is the Hewitt Godfrey a clothing store or a grocer? And that's my problem with this. This is all semantics. People have gotten so caught up in the finer details of the battle that the actual outcome of the battle is ignored. The outcome that Michael Whitman, the famous hero of the Reich and argued as the greatest tank commander who ever lived, is the first recorded loss of a Tiger tank on the Western Front in a battle the Germans didn't even technically win. And the real fun stuff, what happened when Whitman got out of the tank, is often forgotten. And that's where we pick things up. Oh? Now Whitman is out of the tank. Where does he go? What does he do? He is the commander of the 101st. There are five Tigers and a Panzer IV sitting around not doing anything. But he has no radio to contact him. He could return to his group and order them to attack. But instead, he doesn't. Instead, Whitman decides to walk back to the HQ of Panzer Lair. On foot. That's a journey that will take him an hour and a half. And while he's doing this, Panzer Lair start pushing towards Villers Bocage, as do the 101st, now under the command of Mobius, as do the second Panzer Army, which has been ordered to plug the gap. Because Whitman has gone off alone, because he no longer has a radio, because he has not returned to his unit, absolutely. To answer your question, Panzer, why, why we are obsessing over those stupid small details, it's usually on those stupid small details that history turns. So yeah, you, everyone expects that history turns on these big, dynamic events. Not really. It's not really. It's basically, the, it, here's how it is. Those big events are basically a compilation of small, tiny events that all happen at one at, at, at the same time. They're, it's all just, like, so much that they all just group them into one big area. History turns all those little events, 
a, a guy not getting shot and making it up a beach. A tank turning at just the right moment. A guy who sees a little glint of flash in, in the lens before a sniper takes him out. It's always those little events, those tiny little insignificant events that basically did it. But in terms of this battle in particular, I think that, I think it's basically just doing it to just pump, pump up Michael Vittman's ego. Absolutely no one on the German line knows what has just happened. As much as there is panic and confusion among the Brits, there is equal confusion among the Germans. They start to arrive piecemeal in Villers Bocage and find the Brits there all now alert and prepared to fight tanks. Yep. The result was that when Whitman's company under the command of Mobius arrived into the village, all five Tigers and three supporting Panzer IVs were destroyed. When the second Panzer show up, though the Brits were falling back, they were still well prepared. Second Panzer, equipped with Panthers, suffered extremely heavy losses. By the following day, Panzer Lair were ready to attack in piecemeal, firstly almost getting wiped out by American artillery, and then finally getting pushed back by a British counterattack. When Whitman returned to villers bocage several days later to reclaim his tank, he did so completely uncontested. Each Tiger tank had been burned out. The British had covered them with petrol-soaked blankets and set them on fire. They were unrecoverable. He then made a speech about how brilliant he was and got interviewed by a German propaganda magazine who altered a few facts, doctored a few photographs, and attributed all British losses that day to him. As most of you should know by now, Michael Whitman is not Germany's highest scoring tank ace. That title belongs to Kurt Nipsel, with 168 kills to his name, including oh. one of the longest range tank on tank kills of the war at 3,000 metres. Nipsel also drove a Tiger, and would become distinguished in his service on the Eastern Front, taking part in some of the most gruelling and largest tank battles in history, so eventually distinguished himself enough to be given command of a King Tiger. You'd expect a man of equal, if not greater, distinction to have been honoured in a similar way, but Nipso only ever received one award, the Gold Cross. In spite of appearing in some of the same battles as Whitman, he was never awarded in the same way. There are no great tales of his battles, no blow-by-blow accounts featured in books and documentaries. His Wikipedia article is barely a few paragraphs Whoa. long. Now why is this? The answer is because Whitman was a Nazi. Now, I don't mean that as a slur. I mean he was actually a Nazi. He joined the Nazi party in the oh. 1930s. He was a member of the SS, the military arm of the party. He was also slim, good-looking, wore his hair back, and had a charming yet confidently dominating personality. Nipsel was not. He refused to shave. His hair was messy. He. So basically, Whit. So, so basically, you know what? I've come up with a theory. Whitman was a fuckboy. This guy, Nipsel, was an actual. Was just a soldier. He was apparently a bit of a practical joker, his uniform was often untidy, and he was highly critical of the Nazi party and how it operated. Wait, this guy was... Cr this guy was critical! Really? <laughs> how are you alive? At one point attacking an officer, he saw mistreating prisoners. He was also in the regular army, not the SS. In short, Whitman was the very model of a perfect Nazi. And while not a true Aryan with brown hair and green eyes, he was everything Goebbels in his propaganda ministry wanted. This image of the refined, honourable, Bavarian gentleman, whose skill and cunning alone was a product of the regime and something that was allowed to prosper under it, and whose loyalty to the regime was unquestioned, and who could be kept happy with symbols and tokens of prestige. This is why he was decorated so much. This is why whenever he saw a new tank he wanted, he got it. This is why when his friends and colleagues were freezing in the great winters in Russia, he was in a Bavarian spa receiving officer training. He was provided all the best equipment, all the best training, a smart looking black uniform, and if he didn't look quite heroic enough in his photograph, it was retaken so he would be. And when he returned to Germany, he would tour factories for the cameras, meeting the workers, delivering speeches about how important their work was to the war effort, all while covering up the damage done by Allied bombings. He was even featured in a film about how the King Tiger would bring victory that was shown to the German public. Uh -huh. That should tell you more about the man he was and the people who worship him and his legend. Because 
He wasn't innocent. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew those factories were barely operational. He could see the damage, yet he had to lie to the cameras and claim that there was none. He could see the teams of slaves being forced to applaud him at gunpoint. He could see the Gestapo officers pretending to be factory managers, shaking his hand to pretend all was well, and he went along with it. He was not, as PanzerAce.net and many others have claimed, guilty of doing nothing but his duty, because he could have refused like Nipsel had. But that would have mean giving up his station. That would mean giving up his medals and his comfortable life. His comfort. Yeah, it sounds like Nipsel was the guy who's who literally is like, my country's at war. I don't like what we're fighting with, but my family's here and we can't leave. So, lock and low. Let's go fight some Russians. Yeah, Whitman here is a, just a, just a fucking ass kisser. Well, Nipsel's like. No, we're not abusing prisoners. Shut the fuck up and step away or before I blow your ass off with this MP40. I'm starting to like Nipsel. I think I might I think this is a man I might have a drink with. Apartment, his meetings with Hitler, and his yeah. face on all the newspapers and propaganda rags. Yeah. He was a Nazi. He was an integral part of the propaganda machine. A piece of trash. It. He accepted it and he enjoyed the privileged trappings that it brought him. The same could not be said for Knipso, Autocarius, or the 60 other German tankers who could also be attributed with the title of Panzer Ace, because outside of Whitman, that term was never used. The term Panzer Ace or Tank Ace was never actually used by the Nazis, and awards or merits were never handed out based on individual kills, nor were individual kills ever really recorded in that way. Everything was recorded as a unit. The unit hmm. killed X number of tanks, not the individual. Even even if the unit only had one tank. This is why it has been so hard to determine if or not people like Dipsol and Carius actually achieved the kills attributed to them. But it has now become a very well established so fact that the regular German here typically outperformed the SS. This was somewhat embarrassing as the Germans, or more the Nazi propaganda machine, took every opportunity to promote the idea that the SS were superior. The SS was supposed to represent the very elite of the German fighting machine, mm. the idea that the regular German army outperformed. They were also high on meth and cocaine for a time. There's also that issue. Them was in contrast to this, so it became common to artificially create ace heroes by attributing the kills of the entire squad to one individual. This is the most or I've, ever, I've ever kill scores off anything, by counting seriously. armored cars and trucks and anti tank guns as armored kills. As the perfect icon of the proud, stern, brave, and honorable gentleman tank commander, Whitman was undoubtedly offered this privilege. We don't actually know what his kill count was. We probably never will with any reasonable degree of accuracy. But even if we did give him the benefit of the doubt and say that his unit made all those kills on the Eastern Front, then that doesn't exactly make him unique. You see, the T-34 kind of sucked. Yeah. It was rushed. We've already talked about it. Yes, the T-34 was a piece of trash pig. We remember that. I remember it quite well. I still have the aneurysm from that to the front with very little training or preparation offered to the crews. In fact, during the first few months, many T-34s lacked an armor-piercing shell. Mm -hmm. The tank was awkward, slow, and was famously extremely difficult to see out of. The very early models were plagued with technical issues. Yeah. Whitman was in a Tiger, which in spite of that tank's overall failings, it did enjoy a superiority in range, firepower, and yes. protection. Statistically, a Tiger commander could expect to obtain at least 30 to 40 kills before being killed themselves. Even the very worst or the very unlucky Tiger commander would typically expect to achieve an average of 7 kills. On the Eastern Front, Whitman had 12 Tigers under his command, and with all of them attributing their kills to him, Whitman was not some heroic legend. He was actually about average. Hmm. If Fuller's Bacage had not happened, it is doubtful anyone would know or care who Whitman actually was, certainly not to the same degree we see him today. Because in reality, had Whitman not attacked the British, the main vanguard would have arrived at a location they thought was safe, at the same time as Panzer Lair, as well as the second Panzer arriving from the south, came to back up Whitman. They would have had fresh recon, which the British did not, and their counterattack would have had the element of surprise. And 
and potentially been devastating, trapping not just a small detachment, not just the vanguard, but the entire 7th army in a pocket with no room to manoeuvre. Instead, when they did arrive, the Brits were dug in and well prepared, and with six Tigers down, their attack was somewhat blunted. The British didn't lose 27 tanks from Whitman's attack, they lost 27 tanks in total, from an assault of six Tigers to a full-scale counterattack, 27 by, tanks the was their total the loss. Longer. Most Holy of those shit. were on point two one three, where the up. British had he burned their own tanks his after own realizing they were cut off and army. surrounded, leading to one of the British commanders at the time making a famous speech that someone better find his boots, because if he had to burn his tank, he wasn't going to walk to Berlin barefoot. But that commander made it back to British lines. In fact, almost everyone did, and all the vehicles that had been destroyed were repaired or replaced within 24 hours. Whitman lost six Tigers at a time when there was only 36 operational across the entire front line, in an attack that ultimately achieved nothing that would have gone better had he just sat on his hands. But it makes an excellent story. And that's all this really is. A story. A work of German propaganda that changed an embarrassing failure into a legend of cunning and wit, and proof that the Tiger was mighty and the Allied tanks weak. A tale retold by Werribus again and again and again, with very little fact-checking ever taking place, unless it's to quickly read a book or a blog of another Werribu to confirm that everything you believe is correct. It's another example, perhaps the greatest example, of a story where the factual accuracy has been lost to the convenience of the narrative, and where seemingly qualified bullshit. historians have continued to to propagate the work of Nazi propagandists because they think it sounds cool. It is the single greatest myth of the war ever made, and its champion was a pandered propaganda star who was average at best, whose single action when he was finally left to his own devices and didn't have anyone else holding his hand was to lose decisively at the cost of his entire unit. A huge amount of irreplaceable equipment. Whitman was not a heroic tactical genius. He was not the greatest tank commander who ever lived, nor was he just an honourable man doing his duty. He was, he was an arrogant, self-centered twat who shot at ambulances and fleeing tank crews, and who ordered his entire unit to remain behind while he charged blindly ahead, desperate to hoard all the glory for himself. It was luck, not skill, that got him that far into Villa's bocage. Had Zabara not noticed and taken out that firefly, it would have shot Whitman in the back the second he blasted through that hedge. Had Dias had his gunner on board, he would have gotten a rare, perfect shot directly into Whitman's rear as he thundered past him. Had Paddy Victory the been facing the right way, or had his turret not jammed, had Lockwood's gun sights been configured correctly, the story of Michael Whitman would have ended as a footnote in history told to young tank commanders about the perils of driving off alone without support. Because <laughs> of his actions, the Germans in that region were now under strength. They'd lost the element of surprise, and Whitman became the first Tiger tank casualty on the Western Front. While the Werribus proudly proclaimed he stopped a major Allied advance in its tracks, the Brits would retake Villa's Bocage the following month and Khan itself shortly after. Whitman's heroism, bravery, and masterful skill shown that day landed him a desk job far from the actual fighting. Ah! When he threw a temper tantrum, argued, bribed, and eventually threatened to go public about being shelved, he was given command of another Tiger group to command, of which he immediately attacked the British and Canadians head on, on a clear day, over open ground and was immediately killed. Hmm. And that is the true legacy of Michael By Whitman, a firefly. and in its own way the true legacy of fascism and the type of men it produces. They may look good from a distance, they may even act in a way that compels this idea of professionalism and gentlemanly conduct, they may even inspire the concept of greatness, but rather like those people who label themselves as alpha males and argue on the internet when shit- Fuck all these guys, you don't know a th damn thing about what being a, a real man is, so fuck you all hits the fan and when it comes their time to shine and prove they are who they present to be, they are about as useful as the traffic lights in Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Actually, before we end, I have just one little thing to add. You see, there's this part of the battle that often goes ignored, I mean, outside of the stuff that I've discovered, of course. Some people who are more familiar with this battle may know that just before Whitman hit those Cromwells, where Dias and the others were sitting around, there's these two Stuarts in the way. Now, some people think there's three Stuarts, that's because there's this third one that shows up later. It's a common mistake, don't worry about it. But these Stuarts, these are very, very light tanks, very lightly armed, they've got 37mm cannons. The Brits have had these things since the desert, they bought them from America. America 
uses them as well. They're pretty decent little recon tanks, but not really something you want to be in when, Still named after a say, loser. for example, a tiger is driving down the road towards you. So the first Europe makes the very sensible decision. They bail immediately. They just Smart. die for cover. They're not taking any chances. But the other Stuart does not. This one is commanded by one Rex Ingram. He saw this tiger hurtling down the street towards him, and rather than run, rather than bail, he took the damn thing head on. He fires machine guns at the driver's port, he fires smoke, he fires his main gun, all attempting to button this tiger down, to blind it. He starts driving aggressively to try and slew it off the road, his massive titanium balls causing the tank to rock What a legend! Side. It doesn't work. Women puts a shot through the Stuart, and Rex and all his crew are unfortunately killed instantly but it gave time for the others to realize no, balls of steel balls of titanium happening. and many who were outside their tanks at the time including the crew of a nearby scout car die for cover the sound of rex's tank exploding is what made dias reverse into the garden long before he saw whitman it made paddy victory try to get his tank to turn around and gave lockwood cause to realize that something was up and allegedly made him duck back into the turret and load up an ap shell Rex gave everyone just that little bit extra time. Had he not done what he had done, the death toll might have been just that little bit higher. And for years, his bravery has never really been fully recognized. His actions have been utterly overshadowed by this pathetic hero worship of his killer. He occupies the footnote that, honestly, Whitman should be in. So if you're like me, and you have a drink in your hand, to Rex. Cheers. Don't have a drink, but... I tip, I raise my hat to you, good sir. Good Rex Ingram. Oh, boy. So Whitman was the colossal prick we all pretty much knew he was. What a prick. And... <laughs> Ten from Ed. Thanks, Edward. Appreciate. Ten bucks. That'll definitely go towards some cookies for the puppers. Oh, but yeah, Whitman, what a prick. Does not fucking deserve any fucking recognition. Rex deserves recognition. Recogn <laughs> fucking, um, that other tank ace, the one in the army who wasn't a piece of shit. He deserves the recognition. All the fucking tankers in the allied forces deserve the credit. Not fucking Whitman and the rest of those. God, I flipped off more Nazis today than I have ever, than, than ever before. My fingers are getting numb. Oh, what the prick. What the prick Whitman is. And the rest of the wearaboo trash. Nazi Germany. <laughs> Give me a Sherman Firefly and a couple dozen rounds. I'll, I would air out the entire German army. Be, because, another, but because another thing, I know for a fact I'm lucky as fuck. Tactics only go so far... As Napoleon once said, when he's picking a general, he doesn't... Uh, yes, yes, I know he's good, but is he lucky? That was the thing about Napoleon. He ran out of lucky generals. <laughs> oh. He's like, is he lucky? No. Oh, fuck, I need a general for the 45th. Go! <laughs> yes. That's my philosophy, too. I don't care if he's good. I want a, I want a lucky guy. I want someone who's lucky. And he was... Un and unfortunately, this son of a bitch was lucky. Fuck you, Whitman. Uh, Kurt Nipsel. Okay. What a prick. Ugh. Man, I hope the wearaboos are watching this. I, I, you know, at this point, every time I put, I see like a dislike or a, or like a kind of a shitty comment down below, I usually assume it's a wearaboo or or a commie boo, or somebody else we, that me and Pig at this point have pissed off. <laughs> and we just and I just look at them and go, oh, look at that. They're still here. They gone yet? <laughs> oh, but man, fucking Rex, those fucking titanium balls. What a fucking legend. That guy deserves a fucking statue. He, the needs of the many outweighed the needs of the few in that case. God damn it, Rex. I'm surprised that, that that Whitman Shield didn't bounce off those titanium nuts he was dragging. Jesus. Oh, all right then. Well, this was another great laser pig video. Next, the next video, I don't know what it will be. We will see. Either way, yeah. So, 
Thank you all for watching. This was a great freaking video. And thank you all for those who donated. Again, thank you very much. You help support, keep this channel running. You help give the puppy dogs cookies. I love you guys. You guys make what I'm doing. And if you really truly want to like do some more support of the channel other than the donations, the join button for the membership is right down there. You, there's currently only one level. But I'm planning to add more in the future, and really, right now, it's the it's it's the cheaper option. And really, all you and really, what you get is you get access to um, you get so my um my um we'll take a look at pre on maybe next. We'll see what happens. But yeah, if you look on uh, chat, if you look on chat, you've seen my buddy Nate. I don't know if he's still watching, but um, if you see like he had like a little blue star, that's a special l little like button you get that lets me know that you are a member. And you also get access to some pretty cool, like, little emotes. Which I'm planning to add more of in the future. So, do not worry. So, the, so yeah, there's more emotes. There's more levels coming in the future. But, yeah, if you really want to support the channel, join buttons right down there. I would greatly appreciate it. Plus, you also get a thing at the end of, of most of my regular reactions. I'm still trying to figure out how to put my intro and outro into my lives. And we got an idea. I just need to get get my admins. Things have been going a little crazy thanks to Harmony Con. Harmony Con. That's in that's in Texas. Everfree coming up next in a, next week, and the heat wave I'm dealing with here in Arizona. It's a hundred and twenty, reaching even up into the hundred and thirties. I am not happy here. Anyway, this was me. Thank you all for watching. And as always, you know who I am. I know who you are. I will see you all in the next video.